All right, so I started the recording now and Mark and Hank, you are co-hosts. Should something happen with my internet connection, if I disappear, you just uh, take over, please. Um, all right. Um, I think we can start. Uh, welcome to the, uh, I think this is the fourth session of the Dutch Distinguished Lecture Series in France. Uh, please uh, just mute yourself. Uh, so this is the fourth session of the Dutch Distinguished Lecture Series in Philosophy and Neuroscience. Uh, and it is my enormous pleasure. Uh, so I muted also, all, before you start, you, you unmute yourself. Um, um, so it is my enormous pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Olaf Sporns, uh, who is um, one of the pioneers and uh, uh, main uh, uh, developers of the Connectome project and they idea of the connectome and uh, he has had enormous uh, influence on the field of computational neuroscience, especially network neuroscience. And so after receiving an undergraduate degree in biochemistry, uh, Olaf Sporns earned a PhD in neuroscience at Rockefeller University and then con uh, conducted postdoctoral work uh, at the Neurosciences Institute uh, in New York and San Diego. Currently, he is a distinguished, distinguished professor in the Department of uh, Psychological and Brain Sciences at Indiana University in Bloomington. And his uh, main research area is theoretical and computational neuroscience with a focus on complex brain networks. He has authored over uh, 160 peer reviewed publications, and as well as the recent books, um, uh, networks of the brain, which you can see here, and the Discovering the Human Connectome, both uh, published by MIT Press and both widely uh, uh, influential. Uh, uh, Professor Spons was awarded uh, John Simon's Guggenheim Memorial Fellowship in 2011, and he was elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2013. And today he's going to be talking about brain graphs, network communities, uh, dynamic modularity, the evolving quest to link structure and function. And so without further ado, uh, I give the floor to you, Olaf. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. I hope you can hear me. And uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Um, uh, glad to be here. And uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, and uh, uh, after the talk, I understand there'll be a discussion. I look forward to that actually a lot. Uh, I talked with Daniel a little bit already and, uh, and I know that there are interesting questions on the table that we have a chance to, to talk through in more detail. My talk will be more of a survey uh, with a large section at the end about some new work that I'm very excited about and that I would like to uh, communicate a little bit uh, uh, to you uh, today. So uh, as uh, Daniel mentioned, I have been investing in network neuroscience, a new field uh, for many years now, and uh, have approached uh, in my own work, uh, brain structure and function from a complex networks perspective over the several of the last several years. And uh, so I would like to um, uh, give you a little bit of an overview uh, of a very brief overview of some of the themes and why network neuroscience matters these days. Uh, before going into a brief discussion of human connectomics and connectomics in model organisms, touching upon some interesting topics of graph theory and modularity. And then at the end, um, uh, go into the structure function relationship, really uh, how we can express brain dynamics and functional connectivity and what it might tell us about uh, how the brain is organized. Uh, of course, you all know, and you've had a whole series of talks already, that uh, brain networks are all the rage these days. I, I might add that when I got started in the field, that was not the case. Um, my very my very first uh, graph theory explorations go back now exactly 30 years to 1991. But back then, nobody, nobody. Uh, with the exception of two or three people, had any interest in applying graph theory to the brain uh, at all. 
And uh, today, however, that is widely done. We see it in applications in model organisms, all the way from the nematode, C. elegans, to the rodent brain, and the non-human primate, and of course, the human brain in different modalities uh, from structure, structural connectivity, anatomy, to functional, even effective connectivity. So it's a, it's a wide, uh, a broad area now uh, with many, many applications across the field of neuroscience. And why might that be so? Why did it explode upon the scene in, in the way it did? I think um, part of it has to do with the fact that we have uh, at our disposal uh, uh, more and more uh, data sets that are amenable to um, uh, a network science analysis and, that, and, and the network science perspective lends itself very naturally to many of the types of data that are now being collected uh, uh, really across the globe and across different scales of both time and space. This is a, a, a modification, a, a deliberate modification of the famous diagram by Sinofsky and Churchland uh, that, that shows us where these network data sets reside. Really, they reside on all uh, uh, in, in all recording modalities across different uh, at time scales as well as different spatial scales. Today, we will focus predominantly on this big central region of connectomics and specifically on connectomics as applied in, in humans in the second part of this talk. So uh, the, another, another driving force, I think, is that data sets from molecular, um, anatomical, uh, physiological, and even social di dimensions can be profitably analyzed and, and, and modeled uh, uh, with a, uh, a, a suite of network analysis tools that are now widely dis, uh, widely available across the field. And that opens the uh, opportunity to relate these data sets to each other. I would like to stress that I'm, I don't think that networks are just a data type or an analysis tool or, or a, a set of MATLAB scripts, if you wish. Networks are real phenomena. As we study networks in, in our science, uh, in, in neuroscience, we are studying real systems that are organized as networks. It's not a metaphor, in my view, um, not, an, not, an, not, a, not an analog or comparison. Uh, networks are a fundamental way in which complex systems organize themselves, including in the brain, and that is what we study with network analysis tools. Now, these tools have, are so widespread, I don't have to explain, I hope, to, to many of you, uh, what what the uh, main uh, terms and terminology are all about. I'll focus in my talk today uh, on uh, a path and, and distances. Uh, the notion of distance in a network is very different from, 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 from the way it is uh, conceptualized in, in, in geometric space. And um, the, the notion of modularity uh, here defined as uh, clusters of, of densely connected uh, regions or nodes that are connected by crucial nodes, so-called hubs. There a lot of work has been carried out in this particular area. There's a reason for it, I think, because modularity is a fundamental aspect of how brain networks are organized, both structurally and functionally. Um, so human connectomics, uh, Daniel mentioned uh, uh, the, um, the origins of, of the connectome go back uh, now about 15 years or so. When I got my um, undergraduate degree, and was interest, became interested in the brain, uh, brain anatomy, human anatomy was largely known from the section and postmortem histology, as you can see here in this photograph, actually also the, my Zoom background behind me, a photograph of a microdissected human brain postmortem. Uh, and only in the last uh, couple of decades has it become possible to infer um, through st complicated statistical processes and computational tools, infer the likely trajectory of white matter tracts in the living human brain, as shown here uh, from the work of my, my old colleague, Patrick Hagman. Uh, this offers a huge advantage because we can uh, study uh, the anatomy and the and variations in anatomy across a large population of individuals and relate those variations to the individual differences in behavior and cognition. And that has opened up uh, doors to our understanding of the human brain that is uh, th that really didn't exist before. Uh, the next step to, to take, though, and that's what Patrick and I did about 15 years ago now, is to um, conceptualize this uh, this uh, fanciful diagram, the hairball that you saw on the previous slide, as a matrix, as a matrix of what's connected to what, if you wish, a wiring diagram. Uh, shown here in its uh, uh, in its high resolution form, uh, an early uh, an early map that we made, uh, we created, uh, Patrick Hagman uh, created um, 
about 12, uh, 13 years ago now, on the basis of a very small number of individuals. Uh, you see the right and left hemispheres of the cerebral cortex, the interhemispheric connections shown in the upper and lower quadrants. Um, and each of the uh, elements in this matrix signifies um, uh, whether a connection exists or not and the weight of that connection. Because it's diffusion imaging and tractography, the matrix is entirely symmetrical. We cannot infer a direction of the off pathways because of uh, the limitations of the diffusion approach. So this, this type of map, this type of network, um, which this is a matrix of connections, an adjacency matrix, we call it in graph theory, can now be um, understood as a graph and can be uh, analyzed in, uh, this is our gateway to, to, the, to the very large array of, of network science tools that have been developed over the last several decades. And in our early work, um, uh, what we came up with are these sort of, you know, this small bullet list of of properties and uh, still amazes me that even though we 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 made these uh, observations a long time ago on a very small cohort with um, relatively um, simple imaging uh, tools available to us at the time, uh, all of these properties have been found again and again across uh, not only the human um, brain but also uh, animal models. Starting at the top, uh, every region has its own unique. Uh, connectivity fingerprint, its own unique set of inputs and outputs, which in a network, we believe, really are important for defining uh, the functional contributions that this uh, network node can uh, participate in. And uh, uh, the second point is there's a broad degree distribution, what the exact shape is, exponential, scale-free, it's a matter of debate, but we do invariably find a number of nodes brain regions, in the case of the human brain, that have a larger number of connections than the average. So there's a skewed distribution, a heavy tail distribution to, to, to the number of connections attached at each region. High clustering and short path lengths are the hallmarks of small world organization. We find modular uh, modular organization uh, uh, in, in structural as well as functional networks, as we'll see later. And these modules are interlinked by usually high degree nodes, which have diverse connectivity across multiple communities. Finally, uh, high degree nodes in the human brain also tend to be mutually interconnected and interconnected at higher rates of density than expected by chance. And that property uh, is so-called rich club organization. There's other words for it connective core, clique organization, what have you, uh, it, it all kind of points at the same uh, mode of organization, which is that highly connected nodes, nodes that are rich in connections are also connected to each other more densely than expected by chance. Just a brief overview of what this means on the left, a, a simple diagram of a of a sketch of a network with uh, four communities indicated. The high degree nodes are those in black. They connect um, um, communities to each other, as you can see. Uh, they are connector hubs in that sense. Uh, here in the middle, we've added a few more connections to allow them to communicate with each other more directly. And that, uh, um, if that defines the rich club architecture, a densely connected uh, subgraph of high degree nodes, which allows these high degree nodes, we believe, this is the prediction, if you wish, from network science, to more efficiently uh, share, uh, uh, to more co efficiently communicate and share information. Uh, there's an interesting connotation here to so-called workspace uh, theories of consciousness. Uh, I've had discussions about this with people. Um, uh, this is, in some sense, the anatomical infrastructure that might enable uh, those types of models to, um, to take place. Um, with Martin Mannenheuvel, I uh, had the, the, the great fortune to work with him 10 years ago on finding the rich club, and in fact, we found it in a human brain. Uh, pretty much right, uh, right off the bat. Uh, the key thing is a more a, a denser uh, subgraph of highly connect of of of, of rich uh, nodes uh, than a null model which preserves local degree but but uh, this this but this but destroys the global topology. Uh, rich club nodes uh, in, indicated down below are widely dispersed across the human brain. Some are found in the midline and the cingulate cortex, some are uh, in the insula and others are in the posterior parietal cortex. Um, this property of rich, rich club organization uh, uh, has also been ascertained and, and, re, and, and replicated in many, many cohorts uh, of subjects with many different scanners, different processing tools, etc. cetera, for, uh, for the, over the past decade or so. Um, the interesting property of the rich club from a graph theory perspective is that if you want to travel 
along the shortest possible path from any node to any other node in this graph, um, we can track where that path actually uh, occurs and we can track whether it touches upon or travels through the rich club. Uh, think of it as a subgraph of connected nodes. And it turns out that for, for a high proportion, very high proportion, of all shortest paths in this network, um, uh, those paths have to access at least one rich club node or on rich or rich club edge, despite the fact that the rich club itself, technically defined here, is only about 10% of the infrastructure. In that sense, the rich club is sort of like a highway system that attracts traffic and disperses traffic and perhaps allows greater efficiency of communication traffic across the brain. These are predictions that uh, would um, um, would have to be ascertained. I'll talk at the end of the talk a little bit about communication as a fundamental property of what, net, what brain networks do, uh, for me at least, and um, uh, how we might uh, go about measuring it. Um, uh, another prediction is, of course, that if that highway system is, is damaged, if there is uh, damage to nodes or edges within the rich club, uh, it should have disproportionately large effects on network integrity, efficiency of communication, and perhaps also uh, result in greater likelihood of disturbance uh, at the behavioral cognitive level. And that has been looked at with clinical, clinical studies in the past with some confirmatory evidence uh, 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 as well. Uh, Finally, uh, uh, about Rich Club, um, uh, interesting uh, to me was the discovery that Rich Club organization also is found at the cellular level. This was not something that I would have thought uh, would, would be likely, but it does turn out to be the case. He worked here with my local colleague at IU, uh, John Beggs, a multi electrode recording uh, in, uh, in vitro. Uh, hippocampus, uh, uh, the high degree nodes, the highly connected nodes in this network um, are also densely connected uh, amongst each other. Once again, here the normalized rich club coefficient curve, which 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 shows a, a large excursion above one, and that's our indication that that, that those high highly connected nodes are very densely connected in, uh, with each other as well. Uh, finally, working currently with with Ben Dunn in Göttingen in Germany on recordings uh, in behaving macaque monkeys, uh, multi-electrode recordings carried out uh, with six implanted arrays across three different uh, macaque cortical regions. Uh, he he uh, um, found a rich club organization uh, in, a, in, a, in a very nice paper in eLife a few years ago. We're still mining these data for looking at how rich, rich club organization is, is, it varies across different behavioral state and across time. Um, in early indications, I would say that um, this property of rich club organization is in fact a universal property in some ways uh, across scale uh, in uh, large scale as well as uh, uh, single neuron networks. Uh, as it turns out, it's also universally shared across many different species, and that leads me to my next uh, subtopic here of comparative connectomics. In some ways, this is where we all got started. I, I uh, remember my, uh, my my good friend, a uh, colleague, my, my my late colleague Wolf Cutter, who I worked with uh, quite a lot uh, in the early days, and uh, the only data we really had at the time was um, data that he himself. Uh, uh, um, um, combined together into a database, Cocomac, uh, macaque cortex uh, uh, interregional connectivity um, measured with track tracing, uh, invasive track tracing methodology. And the kind of matrix that you see here on the right, 47 brain regions, directed projections between macaque visual and smarter motor regions, was that was the kind of data, very, you know, if you wish, very small data that we. I worked with for a long time uh, in the early days of this field. Um, uh, a larger update of this matrix a few years later uh, was, uh, was something that we uh, looked at in the context of Rich Club organization. We were very interested in, in knowing, having found the Rich Club in human uh, imaging data first, whether it would also be found and, and existed in uh, non-human species, but also in uh, data sets that were acquired with very different methodology. As you all know, perhaps diffusion imaging and cryptography does not necessarily get the best PR in the field because of its indirect, somewhat uh, statistical nature, uh, while of course, invasive methodology allows you to measure and literally see connections much more uh, directly. There's more of a ground truth to it, if you wish. Uh, and we found a rich club organization in macaque cortex on the first try in regions that, broadly speaking, are uh, homologous uh, to those that we see in humans, prefrontal, uh, prefrontal cortex, uh, parietal, 
and cingulate cortex, uh, temporal cortical regions as well. These regions are widely distributed once again and geometrically dispersed across the cortical surface. You see them indicated here on an inflated model of the macaque uh, cortical hemisphere. Um, and uh, that property of, of, of wide dispersion is something that I want to come back to in just a minute. So please keep that in mind. Other species have been subjected to and are being subjected to network analysis uh, uh, in an early effort here, uh, working with Anshin Xiang's group in Taiwan. Uh, we uh, diagnosed modular organization as well as rich club in uh, in Drosophila uh, at the level of uh, lo so-called local processing units, the analog of uh, brain regions in the Drosophila uh, terminology and in uh, rodent brain uh, uh, following the pioneering effort by the Allen Institute, uh, who have provided us with a first map of the, uh, of the mouse um, connectome a few years ago, uh, analysis here by uh, Mika Robinov and Ed Bulmore on uh, whether or not these, uh, um, these, these networks exhibit modular as well as rich club uh, organization. In fact, they do. And there are uh, interesting uh, homologies as well uh, to, uh, to to primate um, centers involved in the witch club. Um, fast forwarding here to my own work with with Larry Swanson uh, that I've been pursuing now for a number of years. Larry, Larry is a anatomist who knows a lot about the rat uh, nervous system and the rat brain and the anatomy of it. Uh, uh, here's a diff we do take a different approach to um, to analyzing a rodent brain uh, connectivity uh, with, with with Larry. L Larry um, and his co-workers are scrutinizing the existing literature, um, published reports, his usually from histology, on um, uh, uh, connectivity in the rat nervous system. And uh, there's a huge treasure trove of, of published data out there. What he does is he he, he aggregates these published reports. Uh, together into a, a data set where each of the elements in a matrix like this corresponds to not usually not just one but often multiple connection reports in the published literature so that that allows him to provide a an overview a top-down view if you wish of all that we know about the existence and strength in an on an ordinal scale um, of the projections in the rat nervous system um, we started with cerebral cortex a few years ago, and you see here a diagram uh, of that connection matrix directed and weighted uh, that shows the um, or modular organization. Uh, I, I might add that there's an almost complete uh, account of the connectivity here. It's a fill, we call it a fill ratio of over 90%. So there's actually very few spots in this matrix where there's no data available. Um, here, here I want to make a, uh, a methodological remark. Um, of course, you know, we, there would be a lot to say about uh, the rat nervous system, the cortex, the subcortex, and and, and in a series of papers with, with Larry, we have dug into this uh, at some at some detail now in the last few years. But I want to emphasize a methodological point at this point because it might be useful to the discussion afterwards that we might have. Uh, modularity, right? I've mentioned this concept uh, uh, qu qu quite quite a few times now. And what, how do how, how do we define this, and how should we use this concept properly? Um, in, a, in a network, from a network science perspective, a data-driven perspective, modularity refers to um, communities in networks, communities of nodes that are densely interconnected uh, and are, sta are standing out for that reason. You can think of modularity as a way of decomposing a larger network into a smaller set of building blocks or, or, or clusters. Um, this is done in network science with a variety of, of data-driven algorithms, uh, some of which are famous in the field, the Lorraine algorithm, one of them. And, uh, and, and it has spawned a whole, uh, you know, cottage industry really of, of, of papers on network uh, com community detection and, 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 and such approaches. Now, in real brain networks, like, like the one that you see here, which happens to be the rat end brain, the, com combina the combination of the cortex and, and the uh, basal ganglia, one thing I want to point out is that we can define communities multi at multiple levels of scale. There is no single, in my view, there is no single partition of a network like this into sets of nodes that is privileged usually over others. There are many ways to carve this particular cake, if you wish, or whatever the saying is. Um, and even with data-driven methodology, we can we can actually get a much more complete account of what these modules look like by what we call multi-resolution 
consensus clustering. What is that? We actually use a, uh, a version of community detection where we can uh, uh, we can tune the spatial scale and detect communities at different levels of scale. Then we can uh, put them together into a single co-classification matrix, which which combines in a single snapshot for each node pair all observations across all scales. So it tells us for each node pair how firmly associated, how much affiliated that node pair is across different scales. So the very dense uh, uh, bright spots in this matrix are very closely affiliated sets of nodes, which really never break uh, affiliation regardless of what scale you're looking at. Um, the largest boxes you see here correspond to the largest detected communities that uh, survive statistical testing and, and, and provide evidence for modularity. Notice that there's many, many scales in between. And this is just one example of a particular rat brain subdivision. Uh, this is true, this basic observation that there is nested, hierarchically nested organization of modules. Uh, we, we have found this to be true really in every data set we've looked at, including humans. So it really puts us a spin on the issue of modularity. There isn't not a single set of modules in the anatomy. There are instead sets of modules that reside at different levels of spatial resolution. And to give a full account of modularity, uh, in, in certainly in our own work, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm advocating for this uh, in, in other studies out there, we should, uh, we, should, we should leverage the fact that we can actually look at multiple scales and get a much more full account of what modules look like. All right, uh, a, a, a brief coda to my first part of the talk, and then I'll go over the functional connectivity in a second. Uh, this is um, a, a model I'm still fond of. I worked uh, on some years ago now with my uh, colleague Ed Bulmore, uh, a conceptual model really of, of explaining uh, why does the brain look the way it does. Uh, it's asking a question about, you know, what are the major driving forces, perhaps in evolution, or development that account for the particular topology that we find, because there are many other topologies that are possible, right? Uh, why do we find the one that we find? Uh, and uh, we we postulated there's a there's a conjunction here, a trade-off of two driving forces. One is the brain wants to be cheap; it wants to uh, make lay out its connectivity with the least amount of investment in volume, length, uh, conduction delays, and metabolic cost, among other cost factors. So it wants to be cheap in the sense that, you know, that you lay out a physical network with as, as least a, the least amount of wiring that is necessary. But if you just want to be cheap, uh, you are going to hamper your ability to move around information effectively, as you can see in this diagram. Nearest neighbor connections only, yes, that minimizes costs, but it does maximize in some ways the path length. Uh, random topology minimizes path lengths, but maximizes costs because a random network is extremely expensive to wire up. In fact, physically impossible to fit in, in, inside the skull. So what does the brain do? It, it combines these two features together, modular, uh, high clustering, modular organization that conserves cost. And then there's an investment in some long range projections that break modular boundaries. Uh, are in, in a sense uh, uh, breaking the wiring minimization constraint as well, but confer a high efficiency and uh, rap rapidity directness of information transfer, which is what we uh, what we would postulate we aspire to in a communication network. And so this this trade off um, uh, is negotiated in really in all nervous systems we will postulate, including C. elegans, Zophila, what have you, and might account for the fact that we see some common universal principles, um, uh, even though these, these species have very different um, uh, ecological contexts and, and developmental histories and what have you. Uh, we are engaged in an effort to push comparative connectomics um, forward a little bit. We have only a handful of species currently for which we have detailed connectomes available. I've mentioned a few of them in the last few minutes. And I'm very excited to be working with uh, some, some new collaborators currently on, on a large collection of mammalian brains that um, we are looking at uh, from the point of view of anatomy and from the point of view of different organizing principles. These are all um, mammals that you see on the left, our favorite rodent over here, Cap Cap the capybara. If you've ever been to South America, you might have spotted one. Uh, it's a rodent the size of a small pig. Um, 
uh, and uh, a very very unique species. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, you know, these comparative analyses allow us to look at things like, you know, brain size effects, uh, effects of um, being in the same uh, uh, order of, of mammals, et cetera, uh, evolutionary relationships. And we're very excited to be digging into this data with our collaborators um, in the next, in the, in, in the very near future. Okay, this is about the half point of my talk, and I would like to uh, now to pivot over to um, to functional connectivity. I'd like to emphasize that so far, what I've talked about is um, pre predominantly about the anatomy, about structure, uh, structural connectivity. Uh, Daniel mentioned in his introduction that I'm a biochemist by training, and 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 and, and you know one of the uh, appealing things on, on biochemistry early on for me was protein structure and the way that. Uh, we can uh, uh, infer so many things about what proteins do and how they function from their three-dimensional uh, geometry, from, from the way they are built uh, as little nanomachines. And uh, I sort of carried, for better or for worse, that approach forward into the space of connectivity. Connectivity, structural connectivity, for me, is like, like a scaffold or a skeleton that uh, defines a, uh, a ground state uh, a space of possibilities, in my opinion, on top of which the brain then realizes uh, a large number of functional states. Uh, visualized here in our recording of a resting brain uh, in an MRI scanner, these uh, orange splotches that you see here projected onto the cortical surface correspond to highly active brain regions where act activity is measured here with the uh, commonly available volt signal. This is a brain that's actually at rest, doing nothing in particular. These excursions of activity you see are quite large. They are of the same order of magnitude as what you might see in a task-evoked um, uh, context. So these are not tiny, tiny, uh, you know, random fluctuations in the back. The brain is quite active at rest. Uh, and that, of course, has triggered a whole lot of uh, research in so-called resting state functional connectivity, uh, with which many of you are familiar. I'd like to add that uh, you know, when, when I was when I got started in 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 this line of research, resting state didn't exist, and later on, resting state was considered, you know, that's say it politely, um, not something worth studying by a lot of people because it was rest, it was unconstrained and did not have um, that clear relationship to task and to cognition at the beginning. It does now, I think, I, I, I would argue, and it has become invaluable really in many, many studies out there. But the key question here is, and we've spent a lot of time in the lab thinking about this, that question mark, how do we get from from this relatively stable, static, you know, um, over over time scale of at least seconds to minutes, anatomical skeleton. How do we get to something as rich and variable and dynamic as what we see on the right? And uh, that leads me to my second part of the talk. Of course, we all know uh, just a little bit of terminology here. Resting state networks uh, are uh, really a new way in which we are carving up uh, uh, brain organization and have really changed the way we talk about the brain in over the last decade or so. We take simply a movie of the kind you've just seen. We take individual frames, uh, snapshots of a movie like this, and we cross-correlate them, and we get something looking like this, a cross-correlation diagram, a Pearson correlation a matrix, uh, where the, um, the high values here indicate that regions uh, on the cortical surface have um, displayed uh, coherent fluctuations across time. These can be grouped together using really nothing else but network community detection uh, into systems that now have uh, treasured names like default mode, uh, control, dorsal attention, ventral attention, smart motor visual, et cetera. That's given us a whole new way of, 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 of carving up the brain into territories that are functionally coherent. By functionally, I mean coherent across time in terms of displaying similar activation profiles during rest. And uh, canonical studies on different cohorts and different scanners give us very consistent uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, ty typologies or, 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 or a, a, a carving up the brain very similarly into these systems. They're very, they're very reproducible across individuals. We all have a default mode network. Everyone on this call, I guarantee you, has a default mode network uh, that is roughly laid out and in the locations that we see here indicated in red or in salmon color on the left. Uh, in our own modeling work, uh, we had converged onto uh, uh, sort of a, a parallel line of insight here, which is to implement 
early connectome data sets, in this case, the uh, macaque matrix I showed you earlier, um, working with Rolf Cutter at the time and, and Michael Breakspear um, and, and, and my graduate student, Chris Honey, uh, uh, implementing uh, these as a coupling matrix in a system of coupled differential equations. Uh, the differential equations themselves describe uh, the uh, electrophysiological properties of nodes, populations of excitatory inhibitory neurons, and come from uh, standard um, uh, biophysically based models of neural masses. This sets up, this transforms the problem of, of predicting uh, functional connectivity from structural connectivity. Uh, it, it sort of it sort of sets this up as a physics problem. We, we now basically are solving a prob, uh, a system of a large system of coupled differential equations, uh, and get synthetic data from that, shown here at the bottom in in the uh, in, in the right part of this diamond, compared years later uh, after the fact to empirical data coming from a lab in Japan where they have they measured actually resting state in macaque monkey. And despite the fact that there was no model fitting of any kind, the two uh, domains of empirical and, and, and simulated functional connectivity agreed to a, to a significant extent, not perfect, but um, to a significant extent, um, suggesting that these so-called generative models, which you know, technically speaking are models that generate data similar to the one that you, similar to the data that you measure empirically, are capable of capturing not all, but a significant amount of variance that is observed in the real animal. Uh, we've taken this forward in different directions over the years, working here with my former postdoc, Joaquin Goni. Uh, we actually came up with an analytic model, uh, not based on simulation, but based on just on graph theory to, to predict um, uh, functional connectivity on the basis of uh, various predictors related to communication. What you see here is on the left, the left part of this diamond is an empirical recording, the right part of the diamond is, a, is our model prediction and the uh, agreement between model prediction and, and, uh, and real data is uh, quite significant. Um, so uh, this, this whole space of, of modeling uh, functional connectivity or predicting functional connectivity from structural connectivity and dynamics um, has, you know, also has taken off the last decade or so and has really uh, animated a lot of people, uh, a lot of people's work and and uh, and there's a huge little shout out there now. I made an attempt to just get a few of the classic papers down on the bottom of this slide and I ran out of space. There's so much really to, to discuss. Now, I want to go away from uh, um, just uh, taking functional connectivity as a static representation. Remember, I was displaying it as a connection matrix of derived from, from cross correlations of time crosses. But that's a static picture in the sense that I take a whole bunch of recording time and I and I and I put one number for each node pair. I put one number on it and I say that's the that's that's the degree to which they're correlated over that period of time. It, it was clear to us from the beginning when we did simulations uh, that functional connectivity and network topology was fluctuating. It was fluctuating across time, even in the absence in a simulation, even in the absence of external factors driving it, or certainly in the absence of physiological nuisance variables like heartbeat or breathing, because our models definitely don't have heartbeat. What we, what we observed in our early paper here is that, for instance, attributes like the centrality of a node, uh, such as the area V4, prefrontal area 46, will fluctuate on slow time scales. This is seconds down here, not milliseconds, this is seconds of a period of, of 15, 20 minutes of, of simulation will fluctuate significantly. There are slow time scales that occur uh, in a simulation like this, and this has to do with the nature of the simulation itself, a high dimensional system of coupled differential equations is capable under, under certain conditions of giving you time scales at which it operates that are much, much longer than the elementary time scales of the actual synaptic interactions. This is something that is underappreciated by biologists to always think when there's a fluctuation, there must be something driving it. Nothing's driving it here except the attractor dynamics of the system. This whole line of work has been taken forward by many colleagues in the field, Gustavo Deco among them, Victor Yeza, Randy McIntosh, others, and has uh, documented in great detail 
that functional connectivity really is dynamic in empirical uh, data as well as in um, uh, simulated data, and that there is evidence from interesting dynamic phenomena such as multi-stability, near criticality in resting state, uh, human resting state dynamics. Uh, le uh, letting, leaving that aside, because I don't have time uh, to, to go into it much, I want to focus in the last 15-20 minutes on more recent work we've done in the lab that I'm very excited about working with my former postdoc, Makoto Fukushima. We first set out to characterize fluctuations in functional connectivity by way of modularity, essentially looking for high and low modular states that occur across time, uh, uh, carefully controlled against a null model so that we don't uh, analyze noisy variations. Uh, and in Mak Makoto's work, what he's shown is that across different data sets, um, uh, very different data sets, large data sets, the uh, NKI and the Human Connectome Project sample, uh, high, high modularity states that occur intermittently have a common topography to it, effectively uh, uh, consisting of this strong, strong internal covariance, but, but, uh, but anti-correlation of systems belonging to the default mode uh, control side of things and uh, the, the single modalities and the attention systems on the other. So there's a, there's, a, there's a common signature to these high modular states. They recur intermittently uh, across time, while the minimal or, or, or less modular arrangements are much more heterogeneous and certainly do not display this common topographic pattern. This now let, leads me to the latest work that, 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 that I'm very happy to, to have been a part of, uh, carried forward by my grad student Josh Faskowitz and my, uh, now my colleague Rick Betzel. Um, and uh, here's how it goes. We, we're taking a slightly different view of, of functional connectivity. Actually, I would say a radically different view of functional connectivity the way it's been viewed so far. So once again, classic functional connectivity, you know, thousands of papers have been written on it, are based on similarity, co-fluctuations um, of node-based activation patterns. This in correlation quite often. Yes, you can do partial correlations, you can do more fancy tools, but quite often, most of the time, what people do use is Pearson correlation of node time series acquired, let's say, during rest. And we have a we're going, we're going to turn this 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 way of looking at connectivity somewhat on on its edge, literally, by proposing that instead we should be looking at co-fluctuation patterns that occur on edges, not nodes. And here's how we get to that concept. Classically, bold signals uh, are measured on nodes, on regions, uh, are converted to standard scores. And the element-wise product of these standard scores, the mean of that, is exactly equal to the functional connectivity. So what you see here is the uh, normalized uh, bold activations of two regions, I and J. The element-wise product is shown here. So when these bold fluctuations go in the same direction, up or down, there is a positive co-fluctuation. And when they are inconsistent with each other, there's a negative co-fluctuation. The point is that the, the mean of this, of all these values displayed on this axis, is exactly equal to functional connectivity. That is what you, if you have used functional connectivity in your work, that is what it is. Uh, mathematically, this is not an approximation or a, you know, a, a, whatever, it, it, is, it, it is actually exact. So all, all, all that we're now doing is we are omitting the averaging step. We are going to be looking at this construct here, what we call an edge time series. And these in excursions on the, on, on, along each edge, on, the, on each node pair across time, we call them co-fluctuations. Some interesting features pop up when you do that. Here's, a, uh, here's an example of, a, of an edge by time matrix. That's what you get when you uh, actually omit the averaging step. If you average this matrix along the y-axis, you get a vector, which then if you fold it back into square form, uh, gives you back your functional connectivity. Again, that is an exact operation, not an approximation. You vectorize, you get this, you get this vector. If you time average, you get the same vector. Okay, so this this construct here is flowing into functional connectivity. We're just unwrapping it in time. What we can now do, and what Josh and uh, and uh, uh, and Rick have done, uh, and have recently published in a very nice paper, Nature and Science, is. Uh, 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 essentially taking these edge time series and cross-correlating them. It's not quite a cross-correlation, it's, a, it's a, a, a dot product, but anyway. 
Uh, and, and that now gives us a, a, what we call an edge functional connectivity. So it is, the co it, it is the temporal similarity, not of node patterns, but of edge patterns. This blows up the matrix quite a bit because now you've got edges instead of nodes on your X and Y axis. In this case, 200 nodes give rise to 19,900. Uh, unique edges and that's a large matrix to work with but one big advantage is that when you go to edge space and you look at clusters of edges that show similar patterns across time you now very naturally can by when you map this back onto nodes you get overlapping relationships work done by my uh, colleague at IU, uh, uh, Y.Y. An, has demonstrated this many years ago. Here's an example of a toy network with a few nodes. And if we cluster the edges by similarity of, um, of in this our case, let's say, co-fluctuation across time, and then map it back onto nodes, we discover that there's a, there's a node here, for instance, that participates in three different communities. This is a, a, a significant step away from the notion, a different way, a different way than to step away from the notion that nodes are uniquely affiliated with one community. I showed you one way of doing this earlier by saying there's a scale dependency, but now I'm going one step further and I'm saying if we consider edges as our main construct of how we deal with networks, the nodes by nature are residing between communities. They are no longer the, the, main, the main community builders, that's the edges now, and they are now uh, a part of multiple communities by design, by definition, obligatorily. It can't be any other way. Uh, just a brief uh, uh, discussion of, of, of this paper, which, which, which is extensive and has something like 20 supplementary figures or something. Um, uh, by, by doing um, uh, clustering of the, uh, of the edge functional connectivity matrix, you can, you can define clusters very nicely. You can map them back onto nodes and now discover that different nodes, different parts of the brain participate in different numbers of communities. There's a simple metric of entropy we can apply to what's the diversity or, or, or the, uh, the range of connections that each node per, uh, uh, um, contributes to. And there's a consistent topography of that across different data sets uh, obtained in, in the resting state. Uh, many, many things fall out of this. I do not have time to go into all of them. I want to, however, unpack a little bit uh, a, a separate line of this work, uh, sort of a parallel line that I have been pursuing myself over the last year. I call it my, my sort of my quarantine research um, that, that I am, however, very excited about. So here's our edge time matrix once again. And perhaps you've noticed, and perhaps with some concern, that there are these verticals, vertical stripes running through it. This, I say concern because if, if you're doing MRI research and you are working with MRI data, you always worry about um, uh, problems uh, of an unwanted nature in your data, right? Uh, how, um, physiological artifacts, head motion, um, what have you, scanner um, uh, instability. And when we saw these vertical stripes, we, we, had, we, we were first concerned that these would be uh, related to some artifactual or, or unwanted um, uh, fluctuations in our data that, that, that we really do not, uh, do not desire to have. Uh, it turns out that's not the case. We, we did a fairly careful uh, cross analysis with physiological variables and with, uh, with all sorts of other things. And uh, uh, the, the, this phenomenon of these, uh, of these stripes, as I call them now, is quite universal in human data. Uh, when you look at um, summary statistic across time, a simple root mean square, uh, which is sort of like a, a way of, of, of saying how much amplitude is contained in each frame in time across, across time, you're getting these uh, punctate intermittent brief episodes where the, where the cortex displays high amplitude co-fluctuations. That means uh, many bold signals across the whole brain agree or disagree with uh, uh, agree with each other in either going up or down. And uh, and, and these punctate uh, events have very interesting properties, it turns out. Um, uh, some of them I'm going to illustrate in just a moment. Now, I want to point out that uh, if you do functional connectivity, you are working on the construct on the left. Very good. Uh, you will have this stuff in your data, I guarantee you. If you take uh, your fMRI time courses and you process it using some tools that we provide um, on, on attached to these papers, you will find these kinds of non-stationary uh, fluctuations in, 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 in your data, okay? So they are, they are baked into what we work with when we work with functional connectivity. They're, they're, in, you know, they're, just, they're just part of part of what we measure. 
Um, so we have these varsity events. Um, they are unrelated to any nuisance variable we can identify. Um, they are intermittent, short lasting. Interestingly, they are present in movie data. So uh, in data where people have been watching uh, short movies and, um, and even more interesting in my view, uh, events across subjects tend to line up in time. Uh, uh, in resting state, they are pretty much occurring at random moments, but in movie data, they are aligned across individuals across time. That su suggests that there might be a, uh, a, 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 a relation to the stimulus, and perhaps to cognition, ongoing cognition. Uh, um, so what does classic functional connectivity look like around events? Um, we can actually calculate functional connectivity components that are just composed of events or non-events, non-events being the low RMS time periods. If we aggregate functional connectivity by gradually uh, sampling uh, individual frames going from high to low, uh, root mean square, at the end point of this, we, we approximate, of course, the real functional connectivity perfectly because it is, it is the mean of all the frames. But if, if we go high to low, we are approximating it much, much faster than we, if we go low to high. What this tells us is that what is happening during these events really is driving classic functional connectivity. So once again, if you've been working with functional connectivity, those events that you've just seen in my previous slide, those are driving what you are seeing in functional connectivity as estimated over long periods of time, including, I would argue, uh, the uh, classic system level architecture of default mode of controller and whatever. Non-event frames are, are much less, contrib contributing much less uh, they're also much more variable amongst each other. Event frames, it turns out, are much more stereotypic, both within and between individuals. If we do a, a simple PCA on, on, uh, on high uh, amplitude uh, occurrences, we're finding a common pattern. This is very, very similar to the principal gradient in FC that's been uh, described by Margulis et al., which really is just an eigenvector of a functional connectivity matrix, after all. Um, and as a signature to it with, with, with control and, and default mode, um, uh, uh, defining a, a connectivity mode where default and, and control are offset or, 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 or uh, separated from single mode, uh, single modality and attentional systems. This is something we find quite consistently across different data sets, of course, and different individuals, et cetera, et cetera. We've tested this at many, many different points. I want to show you a movie that shows you what this co-fluctuation looks like. So basically, I'm now building my edge uh, by time matrix over time. And I'm showing you an, one empirical one from a human connectome project subject. What you're seeing here in red and blue are co-fluctuations that are either positive, red, or negative, blue. What you see up here is the matrix uh, uh, of, the, of, of 200 by 200 brain nodes uh, displayed in order of functional system, visual, somatomotor, um, dorsal attention, ventral attention, limbic, uh, control and, and default mode. And I made this movie to show you that at any given moment in time, the functional architecture that we're so familiar with, those systems I just pointed out to you, isn't all that clear. Most of the time, it doesn't exist at all. Occasionally, you get a, a, a moment like we ha just had here, and we will probably have again, where there's a block structure that appears quite strikingly. And that block structure varies across time. Uh, so once again, the the average of all of the average of all the frames you see up here is exactly equal to functional connectivity. All we've done is we have unwra we have unwrapped it. And down below you see our summary statistic uh, uh, would sum square would mean square over time, it tells us how much amplitude there is on each on each time frame. The point that the, intu and the intuition I want to uh, give you here is that. First of all, this, this new way of looking at functional connectivity and dynamics allows us to, to visualize fluctuations in brain systems at single TR resolution. Okay, the TR here is 720 milliseconds. We are not doing any windowing. This is not dynamic functional connectivity using windows. I am not a great fan of windows, I'll tell you that right now. Um, having worked with Windows for a long time, we can talk about why. So this is a this is a new way of decomposing, exactly decomposing functional connectivity into its frame-wise components, and then ask questions about the temporal stability and um, uh, uh, properties of the frame-by-frame, uh, -frame, the frame-wise architecture of what we see. Uh, just once, one another point, you know, 
paper I, I uh, is going to come out pretty soon now uh, down here um, that I worked on uh, over the last summer, uh, edge by time um, uh, matrix. Once again, the average of this functional connectivity, we can actually simplify this matrix by uh, thresholding it at z equals zero, and then take the agreement matrix of those bipartitions on each point in time. It turns out for mathematical reasons, uh, the brain breaks down into exactly two communities we overlap them over time, we get an agreement matrix, which is almost identical to functional connectivity based on binary data. That's a wonderful way of encoding functional connectivity in a binary pattern. Uh, we've, we've looked at uh, uh, different ways of tracking fluctuations across time using, in this case, a set of templates which define functional systems with respect to each other, um, an exhaustive set of 63 templates that define all possible combinations of seven functional systems uh, in, in, in bipartitions. Looking at this across time, we, 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 can, we can track with very fine temporal resolution when particular patterns are expressed. Again, each frame down here is a fraction of a second. So this is a very fine temporal resolution. What we find is that specific functional systems are expressed uh, only intermittently uh, and only at specific moments in time. Uh, what we see as the final functional architecture as a superposition of many of these short lasting episodes. And we can then examine fMRI time series for specific criteria such as high and low expression of functional systems. This allows us as, as a whole new way of analyzing um, fMRI dynamics. I, I will say there's many uh, uh, antecedent lines of work in the literature. Um, instantaneous uh, bold co-fluctuations have been, have been looked at by other investigators, filtration algorithms, um, caps, um, uh, these are, these are, I think, you know, uh, Markov models. These are very um, important, I would say, parallel lines of work that, that go in somewhat similar directions and are related to what we do here. So I don't want to claim that this is totally original. It, it, what, what's original about it is the unwrapping step, I think, of the Pearson correlation uh, and the simplicity of, 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 of that, really. Um, which makes very few assumptions on, mo on modeling. There is no modeling. And essentially, we're just taking the data the way it is. Um, and so that, that, that I think, recommends uh, this method to, to other users, potential users out there. Um, I will say, just as an aside, we're, we're looking at many different avenues now of, of, of these new types of dynamics that, 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 that we've um, that we now have access to, including ways of uh, extracting signatures of individual variability, um, fingerprinting, if you wish made popular by the classic Finidal study um, showing that um, not only is it possible to do this, this, this discriminate individuals reliably across imaging sessions, but also the particular systems that are involved in, 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 in doing this particularly well. What we're doing is, a, is an effort here to look at not uh, moments, uh, is to not look at places in the brain that contribute to identifiability, but moments in time that do so. We're essentially filtering uh, fMRI time series under criteria, under specific criteria, to see if we can identify individuals better if we do that. And in fact, we can. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. It's work in progress. I want to wrap up here real quick, and then we can get more into the discussion uh, in just a minute. Um, okay, so let's get back to structure function relationships for a moment. And uh, here's my uh, somewhat naive uh, way of thinking about it. Um, that that um, you know, for better or for worse, that's the way I think about it. So, I mentioned already my my strong uh, belief that structure is fundamental. Uh, it's perhaps not an accident that neuroscience, one of the origins of neuroscience, is with Ramonica Hall and his uh, you know observations of the uh, morphology the, and, 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 and complexity of, 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 neuro, of neuronal morphology in different brain regions. Uh, structure is fundamental, I think, in biology in general, I, I would argue, we can discuss later, or uh, certainly also in, in neuroscience. So the idea of the connectome, which when we first proposed it, um, uh, did, you know, the idea did not exist before, then I would argue, um, is based on the belief that structure is important for understanding function. And uh, what we have now is um, perhaps not very perfect, but, but at least partial views of the anatomy, let's say, of the human brain. We have these uh, skeletons of connectivity that define, once again, um, uh, a space of possibilities, a space of possible dynamic states that the brain can adopt by the same token. The existence of the skeleton excludes 
many other states that cannot occur because they are no longer possible to be sustained by this structure. Okay, that, that to me is important. Structure is a constraint. It does not, in the strict deterministic sense, cause you know, functional patterns on top, but it constrains what can occur. And those are anatomical links, obviously. Then within, these, within the anatomy, uh, we have a, uh, you know, a, a blizzard of activity action potential signals being transmitted at an extraordinary rate. Uh, and uh, they travel um, only through those structural connections. So that is sets up a picture of the brain that I would refer to as a communication dynamics, the ebb and flow of signal traffic. Functional connectivity is then estimated typically from time series observations. We record from nodes, we see how they fluctuate across time and we make statistical determinations as to how related they are. Uh, Pearson correlation is a simple way of doing it, but but really almost any other more fancy way of doing it, mutual information, co partial coherence, what have you, has the same flavor to it. It's estimated from the time courses that we observe with electrophysiological, uh, magnetoencephalographic, or fMRI tools, and we make inferences about statistical dependencies. Now, importantly, those statistical dependencies are not equal to what is going on underneath in terms of the communication that are, unfolds in the structural skeleton. And so for me, uh, this, sorry, this, um, this middle ground here, this, this picture in the middle is really crucial. And it's also the part uh, that we least understand. Uh, I think communication dynamics and what occurs during communication in the brain is a, is a, is a largely blank spot in our understanding of how structure relates to function. Uh, uh, so, so we have good data, I think we reasonably good data now on structure, we have estimates of functional connectivity, we can discuss in a minute, why we even call it functional connectivity, uh, I'm going to blame Carl Freston for that. Um, but in some ways, functional connectivity, well, what does it have to do with function, we can discuss. And then in the middle, we have this, this middle ground, um, this thing we can't see, which is the communication dynamics itself, the ebb and flow of signals that are really the causal agent that create functional connectivity in the first place. Also, my talk, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I, I think I won't summarize and turn directly over to the discussion. I, I will say that network neuroscience has, I think, a bright future ahead of itself. I emphasize once again that I see networks not as a gimmick in analysis, um, but as a fundamental property uh, of complex systems, a fun fundamental way in which complex systems are organized, it is uh, a, 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 a fundamental way in which biological systems, but also social systems, etc., are uh, are maintaining cohesiveness and performance. And so, in study we will be studying networks in neuroscience, I think, for the foreseeable future. And I have founded a journal that's dedicated to that particular field called Network Neuroscience Open Access at MIT Press and um, in its fifth year of publication at this point. And with that, I will stop sharing and go back to you. Sorry for being a little late, but but um, uh, anyway, there it is. This is my, uh, that's my view, that that's my uh, my perspective on, 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 the, on the topics I've touched upon. And I'll turn it back over to, to Daniel uh, for, uh, for the discussion, I suppose. All right. Thank you all for this magnificent talk, really, really brilliant work, and I like your idea. So, uh, so we have uh, about one hour for discussions, uh, and so if you want to pose a question, just type Q in the chat, and I'll uh, I mute, unmute you and give you the chance to ask your question. So, yeah, so Q&A is now open. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, Gregoire Bergot asks, do you think that we should abandon the use of statistics in brackets p-value and instead use visual approaches or maybe clustering? For example, modularity can be a problem for classic statistics or maybe multilayer would be the track to follow in the future. What do you think on the use of near infrared uh, spectroscopy using functional connectivity graphs. Oh, there are multiple. There are multiple questions rolled into rolled into this one. Maybe, um, 
did I hear abandoning statistics? Well, you know, <laughs> I'm I'm not sure I would advocate that. I think I think our statistical tools have to evolve. Obviously, uh, one thing that I know in our field and in in, in in the statistics of networks is very important are what we always refer to as null models, which are those alternative realities that we construct to test our observations against. Constructing those alternative realities is actually something that absorbs a lot of our time and, and, and ingenuity because there's many ways to do it. Uh, so uh, statistical tools certainly um, are needed, I think, to to uh, to discriminate between observations that are due to chance or, or, or truly random fluctuations versus those observations that are really uh, due to features we care about. Um, then there was the question about nurse. I have no I have no particular knowledge or competence to really comment on that. I, I, I as a as a consumer of, of brain data, I welcome any and all innovations uh, in in this area. Um, and um, I, what worries me a little is that I, I, I don't know how well spatial, how, how highly spatially resolved those observations can be in the end. And um, that is a limitation even with fMRI, which has, you know, two or three millimeter resolution, sometimes a little better, um, uh, but it's not sufficient for many, for many questions we want to ask. So um, I, I would cheer everybody on to develop new methodologies um, I, I will say by way of just an anecdote, you know, when I got my PhD in 1990, uh, MR, fMRI did not exist, right? I mean, um, I, I, I sometimes say to my students when I got my PhD, I had no idea what I was getting into just a few years down the road. Uh, I remember the very first, some of the very first presentations in 92, I believe, um, of fMRI and how uh, I think a lot of people realized uh, on the spot that this was going to be a game changer and and yet we didn't see it coming and uh, and it has uh, given us for good and for bad uh, new insights and, um, uh, and and I'm sure there will be other technologies down the road that we can't yet imagine but they will come to us and so to be prepared for that we need good theoretical understanding I think of, of what it is we should be measuring you know, measurement tools are only as good as, as our imagination and our level of insight as to what it is that we actually should care about. And I, I, I feel like a, a good theoretical perspective, uh, which of course evolves with time, is a, is a good preparation for dealing with any new innovation that comes, uh, that comes at us. Not sure I answered your question or questions, but hope, it, hope it's relevant. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so James Trujillo has a question. So James, go ahead, unmute yourself, please. Hey, thanks for the really interesting talk. I thought the, the last bit about the edge functional connectivity was really interesting. And I was wondering, because you kind of emphasize this looking at longer time scales and not taking like a windowed approach, um, do you think this is also something that can be applied to task-based fMRI to see yeah. kind of how the brain organizes to solve particular tasks or? Yes, it can be. Uh, I know that there's uh, an abstract into HPM on exactly that. Um, and uh, there, are, there are many, many, uh, uh, basically anything that people have done with functional connectivity um, can be put now, can be put under this microscope, if you wish, of the uh, sort of blow by blow account of what goes on. Um, windowing was always uh, a, a tricky. A tricky operation, I think. I mean, we did lots of windowing in the lab, um, and I have, you know, pu published on it. But it was always <laughs> never clear to us what should the window size be. And uh, there's, there's three parameters here that that we can wave our hands about, and some are better than others. But it never gives gives us more than about a resolution of about you know 30 mi 30 seconds to one minute. Still pretty slow, pretty blurry, if you wish, in time. Um, what I what I really like uh, about uh, the um, this new approach we're now floating, and, and we hope that others will like it too, is that it is number one so simple, no free parameters. We just take uh, we just take that we just roll back one step rather than averaging. We keep the time the edge time series, so there's no window there's no windowing, right? And um, and furthermore, there's nothing added uh, to. Uh, what we what we have already been measuring in the field any i keep saying anybody's been doing functional connectivity unwittingly has been 
actually seeing these events that I just showed you. Um, I, 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 I almost guarantee you if, if, if you have functional, connect, functional uh, MRI data and you use uh, the very simple functions that we provide uh, together with these papers to compute, uh, for instance, the edge time series and then the uh, summary statistic, uh, you will find similar fluctuations in, in your own data. And then the question is, you know, what what is happening here? What's driving that? Um, so these are now questions we can tackle and they occur during task as well. And uh, task and, and movie data have been looked at already and are subject of investigation in, in our lab and in Rick Betzel's lab. And, um, you know, uh, so yeah, the answer is yes, they do occur during task. And nice thing is now, one more point here, if, you, if you're interested in task, um, we have not done this, but but if you, if you have a block design, let's say, you can actually now select, you know, time, you don't have to, you, you don't have to run a window over it anymore and blur it. You actually have access to uh, the, um, you, you have a way of, of taking the individual time steps as, as it were and, uh, and, and investigate task dynamics in greater detail, temporal detail. All right, uh, so the next question is by Daniel Sherrill. Hi, uh, yeah, thank you for a very interesting, expansive talk. I, I enjoyed it very much. Um, so I, James, thank you for bringing this up because I had a very similar question uh, or uh, question about your answer to his question. So about these moments of agreement um, that you were calling events, um, so, did, did you give a, a um, interpretation that could be considered cognitive in any way during the talk that I missed? Or do, do you have an idea of what you think these events might be or if they're yeah. physiological or whatever? Yeah. Yeah, you, you have, you have uh, uh, detected that I was very careful <laughs> about, about saying anything about this, uh, what, what this is, cognitive, where it comes from, uh, because we, we honestly don't, I, 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 would, I would claim some ignorance. Okay, at this point, one thing I can say with with, with relative uh, certainty is that it, it's not an obvious co uh, confound. Uh, it could still be. I mean, no, I want to be. I'm excited about this, but you know, it could be that in a year down the road we figure out it's something that we that we don't care about, and um, and 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 then that's 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 that, you know. But but it's nothing obvious like head motion or 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 anything like that. Uh, the fact that these um, that these events line up in time uh, when looking at movie data, that, that intrigues me. Uh, we've published this already uh, and it's, it, it's quite notable. And uh, so that tells me that, that you know, it's in some, in some ways related to the stimulus, right? The, uh, the, the, content, perhaps the content of the movie or what have you. We have not yet uh, done an analysis, sort of a reverse correlation analysis to see what's happening in the movie when that happens, stuff like that. It, we just can't do everything. But, but there is a relationship apparently uh, across individuals, uh, across time in, in, in when these occur. And that, that intrigues me because it tells me it's not, it could still be a, some confound we haven't considered, but it is not um, just random stuff. You know, there's something that's related to what's going on in the environment you know, in, or in the video. Um, and um, the, um, the other thing is that, again, uh, uh, whatever this is, uh, these high amplitude time points, just for simple mathematical re re reasons, uh, they contribute a lot to what you measure as functional connectivity over a long period of time, right? This is this was the point I wanted to make with you know the events, these these high these high amplitude co-fluctuations drive functional connectivity. So this is something all of us should take into account, even if in the end it turns out these events are not, you know, cognitively important. They do, uh, just for mathematical reasons, they they weigh in the average a lot more. Okay, and if if you're doing functional connectivity analysis, and you just take the long time average, you know, those brief moments in time really, really put out, they, 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 they imprint what you're seeing a lot, right? So at the very least, even if we haven't found anything profound about cognition here, we have, we're pointing to, to a feature in the data that I think people should be aware of. Um, and, and, and that is the fact that these events uh, do play a uh, disproportionate role in shaping functional connectivity as estimated over long periods of time. 
So uh, sorry for that long-winded answer. I'm, I'm, I'm tiptoeing around this. I have some ideas, I'll be honest with you. Um, and maybe in, in a few minutes, I will, I will feel uh, excited enough to share those. <laughs> Somebody else asked me about this, but, uh, but I have no evidence to back up anything. So um, uh, we, we're still at the early stages of figuring out what's really going on here. Thank you. I, I have a short follow-up, but maybe you want to move on to the, the other askers. If it's really short, otherwise we'll, we can come back to it. Oh, okay, it, it is really short, I promise. Um, but sorry, so may, maybe this, um, the events have something to do with your, your um, feeling against the windowing now, but um, do you have any reason to expect that um, if you pick your favorite resting state network that you would have more of an influence of these this event structure on, on one network versus another network, or if you think it's pretty uh, generic to all of these functional networks that we discuss uh, commonly. Uh, and the, now you're now you're starting to now we're starting to get into unpublished territory here. But I I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few hints as to what I think. What I think is what we're starting to see. Um, the um, first of all, the the event patterns themselves, you know, the 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 uh, the types of patterns we see during events are in they have high modularity, so they they go together with those windowed episodes that we and others have published on that relate to sort of the highly segregated states in the brain, right? Uh, so there's a particular pattern to that, which is default and control on one side and single uh, modality attention systems on the other. That seems to be, that's sort of the principal gradient here, okay? This is nothing else but, but gradients. Gradients are nothing else but renamed eigenvectors of functional activity matrices. And we're seeing them here in, um, in, in, in unfold across time. You can actually put a, a loading on each grade, on the gradient across time, basically. That's what this is. They, they are highly expressed during events. So there's a, there's a, there is, in fact, a spatial signature to what happens during the events. In that sense, uh, different combinations of system, systems occur together more frequently than others. And then there's a way uh, that we can quantify, because we now have this uh, single TR resolution account, um, we can quantify how much individual systems contribute, as it were, on each time point, right? Um, and uh, that fluctuates significantly, uh, and it, it also varies across systems. Uh, and some of it is contained in the in the papers that are already out, and some of it is still a work in progress. But it's an interesting question. I've, I've thought about this a lot. I um, the the irony is, in some ways, that these systems that we refer to with names, default mode, control, uh, some other mode or visual, whatever, really really don't exist. Okay, they don't exist as objects that have permanence, okay? They, ex they, they come into existence, if, if you want to call it that, as a statistical picture, okay? So if you, if you take functional activity over long periods of time, and then you do clustering on it, you can do it any which way you want, network methods or spectral or what have you, then you're seeing these building blocks, these, these resting state networks appear. So in that sense, they are real, I'm not doubting that. But at any moment in time, they don't really exist as objects that have boundaries around them, right? Um, they manifest as a as a way uh, they manifest by way of superposition okay lots of patterns superimposed across time and that gives us this statistical picture where we can now see this organization but at any moment in time that organization in totality really does not exist okay i'm using existence i'm looking at daniel he's a philosopher so i hope i'm not messing up my my terminology as to what philosophers would call <laughs> exists and doesn't exist, but, but I, I, I hope you get what I'm driving at. That to me is really an, an important point to make, right? Because we talk about default mode and, and, and control and visual networks as if they are objects, um, but they really are, you know, to some extent statistical manifestations of a much richer picture underneath, okay? And my, uh, my excitement comes from we now have you know, other people have done, have, have gone in that direction. I mentioned Markov models, uh, CAPS, other approaches that kind of go in the same uh, philosophical direction, if you wish. But but now this is so simple, we can actually look at this in, in great detail. And, and that, that's, what, that's what has me excited about it. Excellent. Uh, right. So the next question is by Jonas Granjean. 
I think. Yes, that's correct. Thank you very much for that. Fantastic talk. Um, again, still on the same topic of these uh, edge time series, I would have rather a question, how do you see it can be used for the users down the line, the people who do uh, comparisons between groups, because the advantage of uh, metrics like functional connectivity or network or global network metrics like small worldness is that it allows you to deconstruct complex data into simple parameters that you can then enter into your statistical uh, comparisons. But the approach that you've shown does not, it, it, it continues to provide you a very complex set of data that you cannot reduce to piecemeal parameters. So how would you, how would you do group comparisons using that, yes. for instance? It's a, it's a good question. So I think, um, first of all, uh, there's multiple levels that I want to answer this at. I, I, I think I'm not personally a great fan of using, for example, global parameters. You mentioned small worldness or you know average path length or efficiency or what have you uh, in group comparisons, especially not when we're dealing with functional connectivity where some of these parameters are actually not well defined, in my opinion, efficiency, path length, have no meaning in a functional network, um, number one. Number two, so the fact, the fact that you can get that you can reduce, you know, a complex uh, data set into a single number can be an advantage in, in a sense that you can plug it in somewhere, but it's also, it, 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 may not, it may not be the appropriate metric and it may also oversimplify what you're looking at, number one. Number two, or number three at this point, Almost anything you do with functional connectivity, you can also do with this approach because I was I didn't have enough time, so I wasn't able to show you the picture at the end about individual differences in great detail. Um, there's no nothing prevents you from computing a subset, a functional connectivity component, as it were, uh, over over a subset of the frames. Um, so you know, classic functional connectivity, you take all your observations and do one Pearson correlation. Uh, a functional connectivity component would be you select a subset of the frames based on some criterion, perhaps alignment to a task, perhaps um, internal state, perhaps uh, a summary statistics such as the amplitude of the signal. And you, uh, you average all those edge time series values into a FC component. It's not quite FC anymore because you're not uh, Renormalizing everything, but it fact factors into it's a, it's one building block of your long time function and activity. You can now do individual differences on that component. Okay. In principle, nothing prevents people from computing all, all their summary statistics on those temporal sort of filtered component uh, components. <clears throat> it looks just like function and activity <coughs> in the sense that it has you know positive negative components to it. And like I said, when we look at things like individual um, uh, identifiability um, uh, across multiple sessions, for instance, a la Finn et al., uh, we find that under some criteria, uh, even a small subset of the frames can give us equally good or perhaps even better identifiability, which means that we can now zoom in on individual differences, not across space in terms of functional systems, but across time, right? Or put differently, function, individual differences are expressed di differently and to, to a different extent at different times, um, and we can we can zoom in on that. So nothing prevents you from doing all the reductive analysis that has been done on functional connectivity before. I would say though, and I, I say this in most of my talks, and nobody ever listens to me, that that's fine. Uh, things like efficiency, path length, uh, it really is problematic in my view in functional connectivity. Uh, uh, to put it even more sternly, graph theory, for instance, um, which I'm all for, you know, which I started, built my part, good part of my career on, started out uh, working with 30 years ago, is very nicely applied to structural connectivity, to a wiring diagram. Uh, the Many of the concepts that come, that play into uh, what we want to express with graph theory have a meaningful I think neurobiologically meaningful interpretation in the context of a structural network, but they do not have such interpretation in functional connectivity. 
Functional connectivity is a very different construct. It's a full matrix. You know, every 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 pair of elements has a has a non-zero statistical dependence with each other. There's negative links. Um, it is a uh, uh, it is a correlation, wh which means that paths don't exist. There's no way of stacking one correlation on top of another correlation. This doesn't make sense at all when you think about it. Um, so. Uh, so what actually does make sense in functional connectivity is modularity, is defining communities, looking for um, uh, the, the layout of these communities across the brain. That makes sense. Um, it makes sense in structural connectivity also, which is why I have personally invested a lot in the last few years on modularity and community detection methods applied to both correlation matrices and sparse wiring diagrams because that that does make sense to me but but a lot of the concepts that we can apply in a structural setting path lengths and and uh you know betweenness and what have you efficiency those really don't um uh, you know I, 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 to say it more carefully would need very careful interpretation <laughs> in functional connectivity I'll quote you next time I review a fMRI path length paper. Well, you know the thing is, the thing is, I, I so don't want to go overboard and become like a a, a, a you know a, 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 a this is not a dogma or anything. What you can, what what you still can do is, you know, you you can you can just interpret what you what you're looking at as a topology of a network, and then you can make statements about that topology using those tools. But but in a but in a real setting, I hope I got this across. You know, if you're just taking looking at cross correlations and patterns of cross correlations, you um, the notion of a path is, is is just not not valid, okay? Um, because that notion of a path implies passing on information, but the correlation already embodies all statistical dependencies between all pairs of nodes. There is no such thing as a path in a functional network, really, in, in the ordinary sense. So anyway, that's I, now I, I said this before. It's not like this is the first time I say it, but you know, I just so, so I, I would warn against just blind, you know, application of graph theory toolboxes on whatever data you have. You really have to think about. What your, where your data comes from, you know, and what is what is actually behind your measurements, and what it is that you wish to, uh, to that you wish to describe uh, in in your data. I really feel that the uh, modular organization is fundamental and can be described with appropriate tools uh, in 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 all different domains, and that's what recommends it so so nicely to our um, analysis and understanding of of how the brain is organized. All right. Uh, next one is uh, Basil Freisinger. Thank you. That was a really nice talk. Um, very inspiring. And I'm afraid I have another question that's on edge <laughs> connectivity. Because, uh, yeah, you showed nicely these um, reoccurring fluctuations. And, um, and this reminded me the um, what people have shown in EG with this reoccurring topographical maps that they refer to as microstates and I was wondering how these re two relate to each other that's the first question and then the second would be um, there was a recent perspective paper in Neuron by Waske and by Garrett, Garrett, and they say that well that variability in brain activity um, is very important for behavior and uh, that we don't know yet exactly how variability is adaptive for behavior and whether you may have some insights about this. Yeah, so these are, these are two very good points. I actually have, some years ago, I, I, I dabbled in EEG microstates myself a little bit with, with, with uh, one or two of my students and it was, uh, it was an interesting exercise in, um, in learning about that, so um, I, 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 I would, I, I would think that there could well be a relationship, although perhaps not quite in the same way in which microstates have been defined. Let's say in the classic work by Lehmann, um, as I, if, I if I remember correctly, it's been a while. Sort of amplitude patterns on the on the surface uh, on, in the electrode space, basically. Um, so I don't. I I I I think there is uh, there's a lot of room for uh, future work, perhaps in tracing what happens during these fluctuating 
states we see in fMRI to the micro to the micro scale of you know micro scale in terms of time of electrophysiology. I, I would be interested in knowing what those relationships are. Um, uh, future, you know, has to be its future work, right? I think they're quite profitable potentially, and 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 if this um, this fine scale MRI analysis uh, has any real meaning in the end, is useful to people. Maybe somebody will eventually uh, look at this. Uh, variability and relational behavior. Uh, you know, I, I again, I, I I totally agree with with this with the basic idea behind what you've what you've cited. Um, and in, in part, my uh, my uh, um, the emphasis I put in the last you know half of my talk has been on not viewing functional connectivity, for instance, as a static uh, 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 as a construct that that is uh, that fully summarizes what goes on because it is just a long time average. Uh, it, it's, it's one portrait of a dynamic process which has much more interesting fine scale dynamics to it. And it has been difficult with fMRI because of the sampling rate and, and the, uh, the nature of the data to get to that fine temporal scale. And so we've had, we've done windowing and things like that over the, over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and that whole literature has partly been related to I think to uh, behavioral uh, individual differences in behavior and cognition and and also in in a, in a, in a task setting. Uh, so yeah, so so this is this is again you know a good future direction. Um, it, our own work, uh, my own work so far has been largely on the on the resting state side and um, uh, and then a little bit on with my colleague uh, Rick, Rick Betzel on on movie data and he's working on task. I know that. I would be interested in others out there who might want to apply this framework to uh, task related fluctuations. It, I want to emphasize again, it's super simple. Uh, you can download a little code package uh, if you have fMRI uh, bold time courses, literally just the, uh, the amplitudes across time. You can compute the main constructs in a few minutes and, um, and have a look at them in, in your own data. And then, of course, the, the, comes down to asking good questions about what it is that you won't wish to investigate. Not sure that was helpful, but um, you know, it's a lot. You're asking about things that are really like in the future. I find them very interesting directions. Both, you know, tracing this to electrophysiology. Number one, I think surface EEG may or may not be the way to go there. I think I, I would want to look at ECOG data, for example, um, um, and, and and but then yeah, that's a uh, judgment statement, and then uh, maybe also, uh, yeah, relation behavior. I, I would very interested in that. All right. Uh, the next one is uh, Trey Boom. Hi. Thanks. Thanks very much for the talk. Um, I uh, am sorry to also have an additional question about the edge time series data, but if you'll. Uh, indulge me. Um, so you uh, talk about how these events are driving network patterns. Uh, so I was wondering broadly if you could say more about uh, the non-events in the uh, edge time series. And if you can clarify for me, if you separate out event and non-event data, what kind of network structure emerges from the non-event data? Can you still yeah. recover default mode uh, network patterns? Is yeah. there a different network structure or are the quote co-fluctuations uh, sort of too weak to get uh, significant network structure? It's a really it's a really great question. Gets right at what I'm interested in right now. Um, so I, 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 I'll say in a few words some of the things that we now know, and, and then I'll maybe preview a little of what we're hoping to do in the next weeks and months. Um, so um, what is, I think, um, clear to us now from looking at this many different ways and and I think it's also mathematically in some ways it's almost obvious um, uh, those high amplitude time points control uh, furthermore if you look at how they how they how similar they are to each other across time and across individuals they are somewhat more similar more stereotypic they have that signature I mentioned several times now of default mode for control on one side and task positive regions on, on the other side. 
while the part that's not in the events, uh, I'm not going to call them non-events. I don't like non-events. This is our terminology is a little bit um, has evolved over the last few months. Uh, but 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 things that are not that points in time that don't stand out by way of signal amplitude are more variable. Are more variable across time and are more variable across individuals. And um, what intrigues me is that, and this is our the thrust of our work right now in individual differences is in, in, in sort of looking at those time points in more detail. That, that now it's the time points outside of the events, okay? Um, uh, there's other lines of work, especially uh, uh, involving Rick and, 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 and his, uh, his lab, that are looking at the events themselves, which have interesting patterns to them as well, in terms of um, subject similarities, but also differences. Um, so he's looking at that. We're looking at uh, what, what I'm going to call the, the great sort of the ocean in between of all those time points that aren't particularly high amplitude, that are more dissimilar to each other, more heterogeneous. And uh, but it stands to reason because they comprise the majority of time, perhaps have also have some cognitive um, connotation to them, right? Um, it, it, it's sort of hard to dismiss three quarters what, of, of what goes on or, or four fifths of what goes on in a resting, in a resting state scan uh, as cognitively irrelevant uh, if in fact we do believe that the activity we measure has some, has some relationship, um, loose relationship to ongoing cognition. Um, you know, we, 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 ought to, we ought to pay attention to those, to those lower amplitude frames despite the fact that they are not driving the functional activity. So that's, this, this to me suggests, quite frankly, that perhaps um, our emphasis on functional connectivity, which has been, which is, which is driven by these events, has been on the events. You know, it, it's actually been maybe on the less interesting part of the time, of the time course. Um, so uh, uh, my, my, personal, my personal view, this is, we have somewhat different views in the lab and, and we're discussing this almost on a daily basis as to where should we look, what's interesting about, uh, about what we see. My personal view is I'm very intrigued by what goes on in those lower, port, lower parts of the updated profile. Um, and and my, 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 my intuition is that, um, that, the, that the very fact that those, time, that those states are more variable um, might allow us to see, might allow us to tap into the dynamics better, you know, because there's more, there's more of a, a state space to explore, right? And that intuitively, and I could be totally wrong, that intuitively lines up more with my view of what cognition is like. It's much more of a, of a, of a random walk almost on a, on a connection matrix as opposed to something which is very stereotypic. Boom, 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 right? The events are kind of, they're not totally alike, but they're somewhat similar and they are intermittent, brief. So it stands to reason from my perspective, my intuition says, says to me, that's not necessarily all what cognition does, right? Those brief, in, those brief interludes. It's the in-between that matters as well. So I'm very interested in what's in between. Not sure that answers your question. I don't have a whole lot to say yet. But we do know a few things about those in-between epochs. They are less modular overall. They are, uh, so that means the system architecture is less well expressed. And uh, they're more heterogeneous in terms of if you just look at similarity profiles, um, you know, which information or even Pearson correlation, they are um, you know, not as alike as the, as the high amplitude events. Thank you. All right. And the next one is Amir Dodger. Hi. Um, thank you so much for your talk, Professor. Um, I'm a little bit new to neuroscience and I'm coming from philosophy, so this might be a little bit naive. But I have two main questions. Um, one is that um, I'm curious as to how the heterogeneous data that people have collected from all kinds of fMRI data and you know other types of data, how you know that can be used to um, come up with these you know what you're calling like functional connectivity or structural connectivity networks because it seems that those data must be hypothesis driven. They're getting at a question, and the meaning of that data would be something different in that context. And how might that translate onto this sort of more general framework. So that's the yeah. first question. And the second question, and this is kind of like a bit hand wavy, 
is that, you know, from a scientific point of view, um, is it possible to use the network science framework to understand cause effect relationships in a directly, if this happens, then that would happen. And if that didn't happen, then the other thing wouldn't. So let me, let me, let me get you, get to your first question first. And if I forget the second, please remind me at the end. So this is a very, it's a very good question actually. And uh, it, it allows me to, um, to reflect from for a moment as to uh, what this term connect home actually means. Um, I have said, and again, most people ignore what I say, but that's fine, um, that the, the term connect home is, is most appropriately uh, applied to structural connectivity. Why do I say that? Because as originally defined, it is the set of all connections between all, all elements in a neural system where the elements can be defined on multiple scales. Uh, and some people have argued they should be defined at a single neuron level. And that's something we can't do with humans, but uh, we can do in model organisms. The connections that you that you get, the connections that you measure really ought to be there. Either they are there or they aren't there. Okay, they're physical, they're real. So if I use EM, or if I use track tracing, or if I use non invasive imaging, we would hope that we would we would converge onto some common picture here. Okay. Because it's sort of like taking apart, you know, taking apart a flower and looking at the different components of the flower. Well, you know, we can. There's a reality to it that's incontrovertible, and there's the analogy here to the genome. Okay, uh, why why is an ohm an ohm in the first place? It has to have universality, totality, and and it has to be independently verifiable. It cannot be subject to. Uh, assumptions you make or, or 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 whatever okay the genome is the genome if i sequence it with a modern um sequencing apparatus or i did it as back in the 80s with gels or whatever a t c's and g's man that's it okay uh and if we if we measure it in a thousand years it'll still be a t c's and g's okay and so the connectome as well ought to have permanence and universality it ought to be applied to all organisms that have a nervous system and it ought to be independently verifiable today or in a thousand years, okay? Um, so number one, functional connectivity is not that way, okay? Because assumptions, as you point out, uh, go into it, uh, starting with the measurement apparatus with the bolt signal itself, which has a whole lot of issues that we all know about. Um, but but, it, but assumptions are made. When, when, I, when I look at Pearson correlation over time, I make an assumption that that matters, right? That that matters to my assessment of what function, will, what, or what, what is functional about functional connectivity. I, I, I can make different choices. I can do use partial correlations. I can use um, an information theoretic measure. I can be in the frequency domain and operate on coherence or what have you. I can use phase locking value. I can use, use uh, there's a dozen things I can think of that I have used in my own work. Synchronization index. I can use you know, a dozen different ways of measuring statistical dependencies between observations. And every one of those ways that I can choose makes an assumption about what it is that I'm measuring and, and what it is I'm getting out. That's often forgotten. For that reason, if for no other reason, there really is no such thing as functional connectomics, okay? Because it's always relative to a measurement technique, uh, a particular tool, a particular way of analyzing data, a particular time scale. It's, it, it's never, it, it never has that independent verifiability to it that, that, that a structural account has. Okay, and I know people want to use functional connectomics, and that's fine. Um, but 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 it's good to keep in mind that the term, when when used somewhat broadly, loses a little bit of its bite. You know, it's not as crisp anymore. Um, you know, um, I mean, the field of genomics deals with variable patterns of gene expression, but then for that we have a different term, transcriptomics, perhaps or whatever. Okay. But, um, but, but to me, the, the connectome fundamentally is structural. Why? Because if we use different ways of measuring it that are based on assumptions, we ought to converge. There's only one brain, right? And we ought to be able to, to um, and disentangle its connectivity in a way that is objective, verifiable, and true for all time. Now, our measurement techniques are not perfect, of course. 
So that's noise built into the measurement, but over time they get better. So that's 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 my first point to your first question. It's actually a very important question you're raising. It's often forgotten. And now I have forgotten your second question. So please remind me what that was. Yeah, thanks a lot for the for answering the first question. I think the convergence thing really gets to it. Um, the second question was um, a little bit simpler, but kind of like the aim of science as a as a, I guess naive philosopher, I would think is to understand the cause effect relationships in the world. Oh yes. And yeah. The, uh, yeah. Yeah, this 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 uh this is this is a, this another another very good question. Um uh boy, I mean causality is another one of those concepts that I um, uh, you know, I am wary of using, especially in this company with philosophers on the call and so forth. But for me, as a, as a, just as a practicing scientist, right, as someone who, who is dealing with, you know, hopefully mechanistic accounts of what we observe, um, a cause here, cause here means that, um, in, in a weak sense, to me, almost means a constraint. Uh, that that. Uh, that uh, limits possibilities and allows others to occur. Uh, that's a that's a very weak definition of causality. Uh, almost almost more like enabling uh, or or engendering. But then um, um, mechanistically, where I feel like network models can be useful is they have predictive power. They can have predictive power in the sense that they can predict pr uh, uh, future events that haven't occurred yet. Think of ep epidemiology. Uh, or, or, or social network studies, and or they can um, allow us to, uh, to 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 plot interventional strategies. You know, think of uh, a manipulation we might make in a network in order to achieve a particular functional outcome, a particular um, you know, uh, you know, you know think, could be in traffic engineering, you know, building a new building a new road or 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 closing down a road. What what impact does that have on the flow of traffic? It's basically network science, basically asking about what goes on, uh, what, what could be a consequence of, of manipulation. In that sense, net network models can provide us with a, you know, a mechanistic framework with, in which we can, we can ask these questions. When it comes to, co to causality, I want to tread carefully because I, 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 I like constraint much better. I, I'm emphasized several times in my talk, I think, that the structure connectivity, in my view, does not uh, determine in a strict you know, dictatorial way, what functional states can occur, but it, but it, but it, but it does provide a an envelope of possibilities, and it, and and it disallows a vast universe of states that no longer can occur. This is as important as it is to allow some states to occur is to shut off from consider from ever occurring lots of things that 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 will never happen. Certain patterns of correlation in the brain cannot occur. And will never occur because of the way our anatomy is laid out. So, from, from a point of view of constraint, that that to me is as important. Uh, that negative, you know, sort of like disallowing things from happening, as it is uh, to allow certain things to happen. And what it actually does happen not only depends on connectivity itself, on on, on the network model, but there's much larger. Uh, relationships at play. I, I mean, when Daniel and I talked the other day, you know, I, I pointed out to him that functional connectivity, for instance, is not just autonomously driven by the brain. It is also driven by our sense, our sensory world, and even our bodily movements. You know, if I take, reach out and I take this water bottle in my hand, I now have created in my brain uh, a connection between my uh, uh, visual and haptic uh, uh, parts of uh, parts of cortex. Okay, uh, there are correlations that occur uh, as a result of my of my of my interaction with the world that that wouldn't occur <laughs> accidentally any other way. So, so now it's the brain interacts with the world to the body. Uh, I, I used to work in embodied cognition, and I, I have never forgotten that lesson. Okay. That it's not just the brain doing things; uh, it's also how it's attached, and uh, and our bodies are our way by which the brain can feed itself information and select and create information. Actually, otherwise, wouldn't exist. So, 
this just doesn't, I'm sorry, this is a little bit meandering uh, and I'm going, uh, I'm not sure I'm even speaking to your question anymore, but the notion of causality is sort of like, yeah, we have to be careful about this in, in, in the context of what we're studying here because it, it's got, it, it, it is, it's very, um, uh, I know, and most science wants to be reductionistic, right? We want to, we want to, we want to always nail down what we observe to the smallest possible cause, and that can be a dangerous endeavor. in when we want to understand brain and behavior, I think, because we we may get we may back ourselves in a corner where what we're actually uh, studying has, has nothing to do whatsoever anymore with the with the actual ecological context in which we exist. Anyway, that's a long, that's a whole other discussion. And uh, I hope I was able to answer your question at least partially. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really helpful. All right. Uh, next question is from, uh, I mean, I have a whole bunch of questions, but <laughs> being a moderator, <laughs> uh, I have a, I'll have a chance to exchange those in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe we can talk some other time. Um, so Marto Lieber asks, uh, do the functional interaction fluctuations exhibition exhibit a rhythmic pattern that is with regular time intervals? And if it can be observed that the increase of connectivity activity in brackets, the higher state of fluctuation in one brain area can be related to a decrease in another brain area. In general, my question is if from the temporal pattern of fluctuation events can emerge a structural pattern of activation between two areas? Well, um, um, uh, so rhythm, uh, sorry, rhythmic, rhythmic, um, not um, obviously. So uh, the, if, if, if you're sort of looking at how these um, fluctuations and amplitude are laid out in time, there does not appear to be a clear rhythmicity to it. Um, that's number one, uh, and um, and then the other part of the question. I'm not sure I, I completely got it. It um, uh, it's a um, yeah. I'm 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 not sure I completely got it. Maybe maybe there's a way to follow up or anything uh, like that. But uh, I, I I was I'm sure, not sure I got the um, uh, the question completely. Marta, you wanna unmute yourself and maybe clarify your question. Um. I cannot speak for a long time, but thank you very much for answering my question and thank you for the talk. It was really, really insightful for me. Uh, I, will, I was interested in more particular question, whether the increase in activity if in one brain area can mean decrease in activity if another brain area, if there is some coupled effect. Yes, that... yes. In, in, in general, I would say yes. Um, um... And, and, and even in the absence of, of direct inhibition or anything like that, that can occur. Um, uh, one thing that, again, you know, people, people who are more into dynamics can speak to it much more clearly than I can. But for instance, I mentioned at one point that when you have a high dimensional system with many interacting uh, um, variables, uh, uh, you, can, you can, under the right circumstances, you can get uh, longer time scales, um, essentially for free, the system starts to exhibit dynamics that, um, because it because it displays a, a global attractor at some point that that has pockets to it and, and different regions that the system visits. So, the system as a whole um, uh, can can adopt different configurations, and um, and it and it is somewhat, uh, you know. Almost philosophical to think about what what do the individual elements um, do in the system in, 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 a, in such an attractor? They actually become somewhat subsumed under the attractor dynamics. So they're no longer independent to vary. They're no longer just behaving as as a as an element that can do whatever it wants. But it is now part of that global attraction, uh, a global attractor that uh, that exists and that 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 steers the dynamics in different directions as part of that brain regions certainly can synchronize or, or become uh, become coupled or become can become uncoupled or even uh, uh, inversely coupled with each other and that the point I want to make is it's not necessarily necessarily due to a direct you know mechanistic interaction at that point in time but it is in part a, a, a manifestation of what the system does as a whole 
I know, I'm not sure this answers your question, but but that's um, just one comment I can make. All right. A little bit. Thank you very much. All right. And I suppose this will be the last question because we're almost out of time. Uh, Paolo Martel. Hello. Um, thank you for the really nice uh, presentation. Uh, I'm not a I don't work in the field, so my question may, might be a bit naive, but um, so, I mean, as I understood, you, um, you, you first moved from uh, an approach where you were studying correlations between node activities and to, to, a, to a new stage where you study correlations between um, edge activities. And what I was thinking is, um, does it make sense to consider studying higher order correlations? Because in a sense, where when you study net edge correlations, you are studying correlations yeah. between pairs of nodes. Could yeah. you do it like with triads or tetraids or yeah. higher order nodes correlations? Yeah. It's a very good question. Uh, actually, a very relevant question that's been raised by a reviewer, actually, when we, when we first wrote this up. Uh, perfectly uh, uh, correct observation. Yes, you could, in principle, instead of looking at pairwise, um, interactions you can look at triads and go to higher order correlations that way technically it becomes terribly difficult as the dimensionality of your system uh, literally explodes on you and um, and it, perhaps the rationale for doing so becomes it becomes more of a game as opposed to something that tells us something about the brain we were intri intrigued by this pair by this next step up one level up in terms of the higher order of the correlation because it gets us to, to edge space and edges or connections or pair pairs pairs of nodes still have some established meaning in our field um so we stopped at that point but you're absolutely right in principle um you can you can apply and other, uh, there's there's a couple of related lines of lines of work out there right now actually people have studied higher order correlations where the order can be bigger than two uh, bigger than three etc and uh, that's the direction one can take although it gets terribly difficult um, um, I can uh, imagine. mathematically and computationally and perhaps not worth going too far too deep yeah. into but absolutely you're absolutely right about it yeah thank you very much all right, and we are like spot on on time when we're supposed to finish. Uh, let's all together thank all for this wonderful, wonderful and thought provoking talk. Uh, and also let's thank um, for all the insightful questions, everybody. Yeah, thank you very much. I really enjoyed this. This, this last hour was the, this is this was my reward actually. I, I said to Daniel, you know, I, I give talks all the time, and you know, I, I get bored with my own talk. But, but I, uh, but I really appreciated your questions, and uh, they were spot on in many ways. Um, I really hope in about a year or two, just on this last part of the talk, we'll have a lot more to say, uh, and and also the conceptual philosophical questions were about issues that I and myself have thought about uh, from for many years uh, as, a, as, a, as an amateur philosopher. I'm not a, <laughs> by any stretch, a, 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 um, a, a philosopher or, or anything close to it. So uh, thank you for all your questions and your um, participation in this. And thank you, Daniel, once again for, for the invitation. Sure, I mean, uh, the pleasure <laughs> was all mine. Um, all right, so with that, uh, let's close this meeting. Uh, our next session is on 11th of March, and we'll have uh, as a guest speaker, Lauren Ross of the um, San Diego Irvine University. And we will send uh, announcements in due time. All right, with that, I bid you goodbye. Thank you.